Don't pee on me. <laughs> Who's that? Who's that? Hello everyone, welcome to the True Calling series where I sit down with extraordinary people who have found their life's calling. I'm your host Renee Mazur and today I'm speaking to Susan Juby. She is a Canadian novelist and author of 10 fiction books. She's most widely known for her young adult fiction including the series Alice I Think. She's also a creative writing professor at the University of Vancouver Island. She lives on Vancouver Island with her husband James and their new puppy Rodeo. So hi Susan, thanks so much for being here. Hello. <laughs> Susan and I have been scrabbling around Google Plus for about 20 minutes trying to find each other on the Hangouts and we're finally here. <laughs> yes, a miracle. Susan actually taught me when I was going to school in genre fiction. We've known each other for now a couple of years. I just thought you were the ideal person to talk to about people that are interested in becoming authors and writing their own book. So the first question, what did you want to be when you were growing up? Um, it depended on the day that you asked. Um, I wanted to be a writer, but that seemed fairly, um, you know, it seemed a little bit like being an astronaut. So I also wanted to be, if I was being bossy that day, I wanted to be a lawyer. And if I was interested <laughs> in animals that day, I wanted to be a vet. You know, all things seemed possible. Um, but yeah, it's still a shock to me that I've ended up being an author. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Did something click for you when you knew that was what you are going to pursue professionally? I'm not really sure. I never expected to finish anything and then it was a great shock when I finally finished a novel and then I certainly never expected to make a living from my writing and so that was another great shock. And so every new development in my career has felt like just, you know, this wonderful, I never could have imagined sort of thing. So yeah, I'll probably spend the rest of my life, you know, if I never write another word, the rest of my life just being thrilled that I got this far. Wow. Yeah. Do you remember one of the first stories you ever wrote? Yes, I wrote my first novel, novel in uh, second grade, and it was about a girl who goes to Mars on a homemade spaceship with her dog. <laughs> and I wrote it at St. Joseph's Catholic School, and I believe they still have it in the library because it was, you know, really big block letters, so it was quite long. It was about wow. six pages, probably only about 12, 12 words per page, but still. <laughs> Certainly reading is a has always been a very, you know, that's my thing that I've always loved, loved more than anything else. And so, yeah, and when I went to university, it was clear that I'd do a degree in English because that's the, really the only thing I'm qualified to do. I mean, maybe, you know, I, I tried lots of different courses and enjoyed them, but really it was my only, you know, it was very clear to me what direction I needed to take was something to do with writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So did you find then in school that that was only reinforced as you went through your degree? No, not at all. I found that my English degree had very little to do with creative writing. Um, so I learned to write essays and I learned to appreciate the greats of literature. I did not, however, become a better fiction writer. I mean, I was immersed in great writers, but um, the craft of writing fiction and the, um, the skill of reading and analyzing fiction are quite, you know, I think they're quite different. Uh, the way that uh, writers approach a piece and the way that a a literary um, scholar approaches a piece, they're, they're quite, you know, they're not the same at all. Um, being able to write great essays does not mean that you can be lively on the page and a good storyteller necessarily, and vice versa. Lots of very, very good writers are not tremendous academically. Mm -hmm. It's like a different, almost a different part of the brain, the creative tapping into the story versus a, a more analytical view of, of a piece of work. Yeah, absolutely. And so some people combine them both very effectively. Um, and, you know, of course, the reading part of English literature is critical. Um, I think everybody who wants to be a writer should be reading as though they're taking a degree in English literature, you know, get to know all the different styles and modes and, you know, pursue, John, you know, different writers all the way through their career to see how they've developed and um, look at the different threads that have, you know, created the tapestry of our literary culture. But, um, but telling your own stories is a different thing. Do you think writers are born or made? I'm not sure. I've, I've, it, because there's so many things that go into being a writer. Um, the first one is that it um, requires a certain amount of willful disregard for things like financial well-being and um, sure, you know, sure reward. <laughs> you know, it's just a very, it's, it needs to be, I think to do it well or the people who do it, it's sort of a compulsion because there's no, there's no 
job fair place where you go and they say, yeah, absolutely, if you become a writer, you're going to start at 30000 and you're going to work your way up to 60000 It's just going to be wonderful. It's just this very um, clear career path. Writers, nobody says to the person who wants to write but isn't writing, well, where is your book? Um, oh, I've been waiting for your book. Nobody's waiting for our stuff. We have to be have that obsession with making it happen regardless of what the um, – you know how it's going to be received so that's partly you know you need a certain level of skill I think if you're going to do it and you can you can get much better I've seen people start programs um, with fairly weak skills and come out really strong um, however some people don't have the storytelling gene and it's not something just like some people don't have the math gene it's just you know you just don't have it um, so it's two things but I think a willfulness is a huge part of being a writer um, you have to be writing all the time. You have to be reading all the time. You have to be trying to develop. It's um, and it's not something you've. It's got to come from inside, as opposed to if you want to be a, an electrician, you know, there's a very particular way you go through that. Writing's not the same. Mm. Yeah, kind of a different journey for everybody. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. Yeah. One of um, another creative writing professor, he wrote up on the board and he said, everybody put this on your fridge, put this on your room, and he just <laughs> wrote up, a writer writes. Yes, it's true. And that's kind of the secret sauce. <laughs> it is, and it's, um, that is the part that a lot of people find difficult, even very, very talented, you know, I've known lots of very talented writers who start things and they're amazing and they're beautiful and they just don't finish anything. Um, and thinking about writing is not the same as writing. Two very, you know, and everyone needs to find their particular process through that game. But um, if you're not writing, um, you may just have one piece in you. It's a, you know, it's a funny mm. little world. Yeah. What does your process look like? Uh, so I write. I try to write every day. And uh, in the last few years, I've always had a, probably two projects on the go. So I have, you know, I'll be revising one and writing another one. Um, so in the morning, usually I do my fresh writing, my new writing. Um, and in the afternoon, I'll do editing and revision. Um, so, you know, as I say, I start first thing in the morning when we had a very, we had an old dog. <laughs> and so he would go out and I would feed him and whatever, and then he would just lay beautifully and quietly while I got my writing done. We now have a very, very young dog who does not lay quietly. So he goes out and then I start my work um, in between whining and scrabbling. And um, and I get a certain number of words done or pages or whatever it is, and then I take a little break, and then I start whatever's next. Um, and then when I'm teaching, which is about six months a year, I teach part time, so I you know schedule that in as well. So you've really got three kinds of work happening for you throughout the year. Um, no, I have. I this is the longest I've ever been without a book since I started getting published because. Oh. Um, the, a new book that I have called The Truth Commission sold last spring. Um, well, actually, it sold well before last spring. It sold last fall almost to it to Penguin Canada, and then in the spring it sold to Viking in the U.S., and that was great. But their publication schedule was quite a bit, um, you know, it was a longer lead time. So now that delayed the Canadian launch. So I haven't had a book for, I didn't have one last year. I don't have one this year, so I'll have two next year. Um, so... I will be writing one thing, editing another thing generally, teaching, and then promoting and marketing. Right. That's yeah. kind of a whole other beast that comes along with writing that yes. is kind of uh, unexpected, especially from people that like to spend their time, you know, um, at their keyboards, writing in hand, quietly, sort of a, an introverted type of work style. Yeah, and so depending on where you're at in your career, um, there's a certain level of time spent traveling going around to festivals and schools and talking and you know doing all that kind of stuff and a lot of marketing now is done online so it's blogs um, interviews um, I do lots of visits uh, by actually um, Google Hangout believe it or not <laughs> <laughs> I do lots of hangouts into schools um, yeah so there's that whole piece too but that's you know it's a much more active and when you write young adult fiction there's like two main um, time so you you tour in the like this time of year if you have a new book out and then you tour again in the fall if you're not engaged with other work right it's the the two seasons um, of publishing yeah. and some um, well some publishers have three seasons but they're the season that teen fiction writers often will be touring oh okay. yeah and those who write for adults will tour the season or maybe two seasons with their book if if they're touring 
a lot of touring now is done virtually. Oh wow! So like, through things like Google Plus. Yes. Yeah, um, because publishers, for the most part, don't have the money to ship writers around anymore. Um, so unless you're at a certain level, they won't tour you. You can tour yourself, um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what is, uh, in terms of writing, what do you think is the best and the worst part of what you do? Oh, um, well, the best part is getting a good sentence and a good story and making myself happy with my stories that's um, you know if I have a good day at the keyboard then I'm quite exuberant and feel like I need to you know it's just so wonderful and it's obviously the best thing ever written um, so that's great um, it's not great when it's not going well and I think woof we're lost here we are lost in the weeds because you never learn every book is completely different and so sometimes you're just writing and thinking this has to get better um, and that's always a little bit difficult. Writing is very much at least a novel length work and even shorter stuff. It's an act of faith. You start out with the greatest intentions and sometimes it uh, it goes to pieces on you. And that's, uh, you know, it's painful, but that's part of the job. Um, so that part is, um, the writing part is great. When people like the work, that's wonderful. When somebody decides to pay you for the work, that's wonderful. The worst part is when people hate the work and are, you know, intent on letting you know that's not that fun. <laughs> Mm. Rejection is um, so, and it's taken me years to kind of like back away from the whole reader. So some writers that I know say, "Oh, I love to hear from readers who don't like it, because I just learn from them," <laughs> and that's not my feeling at all. Um, I have never learned from a bad review. Um, <laughs> ever. You know, all I've learned is like resentment, and hatred. Um, but that's my immature personality because I'm not. You know, I, so the people who say that, I sort of think. Um, Really, you really didn't write your best book. You were waiting for this, you know, person in Wichita to tell you what could be better. Um, it's it's sort of weird to me, but um, anyhow, uh, yeah. So the worst part is when people don't like it. You throw it all out there, and then my job is to kind of, if I'm going to learn from somebody, it'll be you know readers that I trust and my editors and all the rest of that stuff. Is that who you go to when you're having a kind of a rough day writing, or? Um, how do you deal with those days when you said you get lost in the weeds? What are some some ways you cope with that and get you out of there? <clears throat> there I walk. Um, nobody has ever gotten me out of the weeds except for me. Um, and so when I'm lost and I think oh, I don't know what's happening, I've lost control of the story, or somebody's flat, or this I don't I don't even believe this. How are readers going to believe this? I go for walks, long, long, long walks, and um, eventually, if I am diligent and stay in front of my keyboard and do enough walking. It goes click, 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 and it just falls into place. And I say, ah, oh, that's what was wrong with it. But, it, you know, it doesn't happen on my schedule necessarily. Um, mm. So there's a lot of, you know, the longer I write, the more stuff is in the back of my head for projects to come. And the more time a project spends in my head, the more time my subconscious has to solve the problems, if that okay. makes any sense. Yeah. Uh, and so, so I get it to a certain level two or three revisions and then I give it to my editors and they will give me their feedback and then it's more click 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 oh yes I got that wrong I got that wrong now I understand what the problem is and so forth and when I get lost I'm just lost um, and uh, then you know you can back up and try to figure out where you got lost or sometimes it's just a mess and uh, it takes a while for you to figure out what the problem is but it's it's partly experience and partly you know some things aren't gonna work out you know I have projects that have not worked out um, and those live in my desk and maybe someday the click 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 they'll start making little rustling noises in there I'll say oh that's what what's wrong with you okay let's bring you out um, but there's no yeah um, I've been very fortunate in that usually things have been salvageable but most of them go through a dark night of the soul mm. phase you know I, I'd say maybe three of my books have been gifts um, where I just you know they just unfolded and you know in a way that was really wonderful but other ones it's very much, you know, mountain climbing and glacier climbing and whatever else to try to figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. Definitely a labor. <laughs> yes, definitely a labor. And that's part of it. I don't think you can be a writer unless you're really fascinated with that process of getting it right. Um, if you're truly attached to the idea that um, it comes out and that's the way it is, that's not a very good... <laughs> uh, you really, you know, revision. In addition to writing, writers write writers revise and they probably spend more time revising than they do writing. Mm -hmm. There are exceptions to that rule but there are very many.
Yeah. In order to sculpt something, you need to start with a block of yes. clay. Yes. And for writers, it's just really like getting it all out and then knowing that most of that stuff is going to go, but you have some beautiful work inside of there. It's yeah, exactly. And you work. have, you know, you've got, you've got to work on the shape, and until you've got it out, you don't know what shape would be beautiful for it. I mean, sometimes you do, sometimes it comes out in a shapely way, but it's all messy inside, so you just, you don't know. Like, um, the revision process, again, is, you know, you have to get it down, stand back, and say, are the problems structural? Are there character problems? Are they sentence by sentence problems? Is the point of view wrong? Um, and that's where it's great to study creative writing so that you know what all the basic craft elements are and you can pull them out and say, is this the perfect thing for this particular story? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm really curious about how much your environment, living on Vancouver Island, how does that influence your writing? Uh, well, it, um, I wrote my first three novels uh, I wrote them in Vancouver, um, so I lived in a small northern town called Smithers for most of my childhood, uh, well, till I was 19, moved to Toronto for three years, and then lived in Vancouver for 10 years. So I started writing seriously in Vancouver, but I wrote about Smithers, the town I grew up in, okay. and then when I, I tried to write about Vancouver, and I tried to write about Toronto, but it's not in my heart. Like, I'm not, I am never going to be, even though I spent, you know, a good chunk of my adult life in cities, they don't speak to me as a storyteller. My characters are never from cities, um, or they might be from cities, but they gravitate to small towns. So um, I like Vancouver Island. As soon as I moved here, I started writing about, you know, characters and, and settings in on Vancouver Island. So now everything's set in or around Nanaimo. Mm -hmm. your, one of your recent books was the, the Wolfield Poultry Collective. Yes. And that took place in a town that I grew up beside. Oh, <laughs> so. okay. It's just so fascinating to read about that. So you're really your love is for the smaller, the smaller towns, and that's where um, you know I w was very much shaped by a small town, loving it, hating it, feeling great ambivalence about it. Um, and I do like the way that um, you know, like a lot of people who write about small towns, they're kind of a dying thing, um, especially in America. Um, but they're so very specific. Um, that, uh, yeah, I love to read stuff set in cities. Uh, that's really fun to me, but I, I just don't seem to be able to write about a city in a way that is convincing. Hmm. Yeah. Let's go back to uh, your first uh, big novel, which was Alice, I Think. Um, what was it like? So you've, you've written this book. What was it like trying to get it published? Uh, so I wrote it, and then um, I wasn't even certain it was a novel. It was just a collection of journals that I keep over here in my studio, and I um, somebody encouraged me, my godfather encouraged me to try to get it published, and so I started sending it out. I was working as an editor at that time in a non-fiction how-to book publishing company, and I knew with what great disregard first novels um, and unsolicited manuscripts were received by publishers, <laughs> so I was very nervous, but I sent it out, and I tried um, smaller Vancouver presses, mm -hmm. And they all said, oh, no, thank you. Um, this is too young for our adult list, and this is too old for our kids list. Uh, and so I, you know, I was, it was very depressing. And, um, and I think they wondered what was wrong with me when they read the book, because um, it is a little bit of an odd duck as a, of a book. Um, and then finally, one of them said they were willing to take it on, uh, Thistledown Press in Saskatoon, and that was a great day. Before that, I had a press who's since gone bankrupt. Um, hmm consider it for six months uh, before telling me um, they um, that it was too young for their adult list and too old for their children's list and then they said and we're no longer accepting unsolicited manuscripts which was code for don't ever send us another manuscript. Mm -hmm. so, um, it was very depressing but finally Thistledown took it on and it started to find its place. Um, there was an audience for a weird a novel about a weird girl from Smithers and, and it was yeah it was great and um, Thistledown was very good to me. I got, you know, as I say, award nominations and stuff. And so I wasn't done with Alice. And I wrote the second Alice book, Miss Smithers. And that one um, got, you know, I at that point um, I got an agent and a major American publisher. And that was, and so they, re, they all republished Alice, which was fascinating to go from a small Canadian press to a great big American and Canadian press. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And to go from making you know very little money to making enough to live on—that was also a shock with the same book. Yeah, 
And that was, is that kind of the book that launched you into, like, Susan Juby, the writer? Uh, yes. Um, and so I was really fortunate that my first book did get published and that it found its audience. Um, really, you know, there are good books and there are bad books, but part of what every book is trying to do and every writer is trying to do is find their people. Um, yes. So, you know, I was lucky that I found a lot of my people. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think, it, is a lot of um, submitting your novel really researching who the press is and what kind of books and, and finding their audience so that you can in turn find yours? How much work do you have to go into finding a publisher or do you just kind of spray and pray and hope someone picks it up? Uh, well, I thought I'd done, re I thought the book was an ad, Alice, I think, I thought it was a novel for adults. Um, I thought it was a comedy uh, for adults. And uh, so I sent it to people I thought would be interested in that kind of a story. And as I say, they just felt like it didn't hit, it wasn't quite right. So it was this kind of weird crossover thing. Um, and so I thought I was targeting beautifully. I was not. Um, and finally, one of those rejectors said, I think this is a young adult novel. When I, and so I started sending it to people who publish for adults and or young adults and then finally found a place. Um, it was a kind of a combination of research and, as you say, spray and pray. That's great. I love that term. <laughs> yeah, so hearing some feedback from someone that's telling you no ended up being one of the most valuable things that... Yeah, you hear. giving me a little bit of direction. And then, you know, now with an agent, she does all of that. Like, she looks at what editors, what publishers, yada, yada. And ideally, by the time you've hit a, you know, you, you have long-term relationships with your publishers and... Mm -hmm. This is a, a weird question, and it also contains the word weird. Um, I'm wondering, what do you think, is there something that's weird about you, and do you use it uh, to your advantage uh, in what you do? Um, well, it's, it sounds a bit precious, but yeah, I'm really weird. Um, yeah, <laughs> deep down, fundamentally weird. I look pretty normal, but I'm sort of famous for being odd. Um, and that's just, you know, occasionally socially awkward, which I've learned to, you know, embrace. Um, and like a lot of writers, I has, have a tendency to be in a situation, but outside a situation. Like I've always kind of straddled, um, you know, lots of different worlds. Um, never completely able to forget myself in a moment, um, which is also very writerly. Um, like I'm not... Um, uh, you know, there are people who are very otherworldly. That's not me at all. I'm not, um, you know, ethereal in any way. I'm just odd, um, and I, <laughs> I recognize that. So, and all of my characters are weird, um, every single one, and that's what I love about them. Um, so, you know, God bless the weirdos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, like I just um even your blog you mentioned your blog is uh, completely bird based it's that's the theme which mm -hmm. is unique birds and you even mentioned that none of your books have to do with birds it's just not <laughs> no it's not I just like birds yeah do I know anything about birds not really no I just like the way they look uh, <laughs> so yeah embracing your inner dilettante uh, yeah so um I'm not sure that you know beautifully well adjusted people who've had no troubles in their lives would probably be very interesting writers. There are a few, but uh, yeah. I think there's a certain level of alienness that a writer can use to try to unpack other people. Mm. Like if you just fit in beautifully, like where is the curiosity there? Um, yeah, but if you've always felt like you missed something critical, then you get to go through you know, life trying to figure out what that is. Yeah, exactly. What gets you in flow? Oh, uh, luck. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, sitting down at the same time every day, having a schedule, like uh, making myself available for flow, that's what gets me in flow. Um, yeah, and, uh, you know, when it's happening, it's marvelous. And, uh, yeah, it's um, walking, as I say, walking is really, really important, um, is that walking puts me in a space where ideas start to generate and then I can sit down and, and get the work done. Um, but flow is not something you can just hit your button and say, oh yeah, I want to have amazing artistic flow today. Um, sometimes I'll start down, sit down and feel like, oh, I got nothing except for indigestion and uh, you know poor sleep quality. And before you know it, I've written my favorite thing I've written in a, two months. You know, So you just don't know. Um, right. Schedule for me is really important. Yeah, I think you just hit the nail on the head is allowing opportunity for flow. You just need to make uh -huh. time for it. Yeah, and if you're not, 
you know, it might show up, and if you're watching television or whatever, uh, it's not, you know, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Have yeah. there? Um, I found that sometimes I have moments um, where I think of something, it's just an idea about, oh, that's, a, I get excited about it and pumped, but because I'm in a, a space or a time where it's not working, I'm like, I'll get to it later, and I'll remember it later, oh. and I'll never do. Yeah, well, what is it? I think they say that you have about 30 <laughs> seconds or something before you're likely to forget your idea. Like, it's very short. Um, so, you know, as any writer, writing teacher will tell you, you should be have a, you know, um, a notepad or a little recorder or your cell phone. I send myself um, texts all the time about things that need to, um, you know, I want to remember. I never look at them, but that's okay. <laughs> I make the effort. Has there ever been a time when uh, you just dropped something you were doing to go get an idea out? Um, oh, I'll do that all the time to make a note um, and then go, you know, put it around my computer or whatever. But I don't generally um, drop everything to go and have a writing session because I have such a, like, scheduled writing life already. Um, I think some people do. I think that would be very romantic. Um, I'm sort of anti-romantic in all things, uh, which comes across in my writing, but, yeah. <laughs> um, is there anything you wish you were better at? Oh, description? Um, poetry? Uh, gymnastics? <laughs> uh, yeah, I wish I was more poetic in my sensibility. I'm not at all. Um, I'm comedic in my sensibility. My music or my language is, you know, it's got vigor and it can be vivid, but it's not poetic language, and I very much admire the, you know, the lyrical writers. Um, I am not a lyrical writer, and I've, I've actually... I went to a wonderful festival where they had a band play behind you, a live band, while you read a piece of your work. And so the poets it sounded amazing, and oh, it was wonderful. And then I got up and I thought, oh my god, it was just awful. Um, oh. It's not uh, just not built that way. So my stuff's funny; it, it works great as audio, but it's not musical. Oh, okay. So maybe I'll take a poetry class. I don't know. <laughs> so the people who wrote about fire and stuff, they could really... <laughs> but people who were writing about what I was writing about, it, it just didn't sound that good. <laughs> no, it was not mesmerizing in any way. <laughs> um, Which just kind of, like, cements your weirdness, I feel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, although I will say that, um, you know, uh, if, if it's just a straight-up reading, I'll always go for the comedy every time. Yep. Yeah, it's something another teacher told me was that yeah, always go for the laugh um, rather than the you know the the solemn sort of sad moment because it's really hard to to feel something when your audience is dead silent. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, and there are those writers who are that poetic that they can do it, um, but I always enjoy reading. You know, my stuff's fun to read from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just not with a backup band. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a polka band. Maybe I could do okay with a polka band. Who knows? Yeah. What's the best advice you've ever received? Uh, just that advice that your writing teacher gave you, right? Um, I was thinking, getting ready to write, you know, sort of wanting to write, yearning to write, um, feeling a lot of terror about writing, and I uh, asked this guy who was a famous Canadian TV writer, I said, what advice can you give me about being a writer? And he said, well, do you write anything? And I said... No. <laughs> and then thought he was an asshole. Um, but he was right. Uh, like, there's no point talking about it until you're doing it. Like, there's until you have something down, don't talk about it. Just just do it. Um, mm -hmm. And then you can start to... Because um, talking about it can be a thing that people do instead of doing it. And also to find your, find your stories. You know, every single person, you, you know... What you have is you. Every single one of us has us and uh, and a way to tell our particular stories. I'm actually going to jump back because I'm curious about this other question that came up. Your, your writing is more uh, humorous on that side and you, yeah. you kind of wished you had the more lyrical sense about writing. But for the books you read, do you find that you read mostly comedic books or do you, read, do you go toward the more poetic writing? Um, I read everything. So I love the poetic writers as long as there's a story. Um, I'm not wild about poetic and sort of just on the page. That um, does not appeal to me. That's my young adult 
uh, writer side talking. Um, I love every kind of story. So you know, I read lots of crime fiction. I read tons and tons of creative nonfiction. I read genre fiction. Oh, squeaky! Somebody's having a nightmare. Puppy. Um, <laughs> yeah, I read everything, um, and I want to keep reading everything. Um, yeah. yeah, everything, everything. If it's Thanks. any good at all, I want to try it. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I say I would like to write lyrically, um, I mean, I think it would be nice. I actually am pretty happy with how I write. I can, you know, it's, I'm not going to try to be a different writer. I just admire that because it's not something in me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there's always something I feel we can pull from someone else's experience to uh, yeah. learn from. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you remember the last book you read that you just could not put down? Oh, there have been so many lately. It's been such a good phase for me of um, reading. Uh, well, there were two that the Goldfinch, I think she just won the Pulitzer for the Goldfinch, Donna Tart. Um, I'd been, me and all of her fans had been waiting for 10 years for that book, and it was mm. worth every second. I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. Um, Donna Tart is, you know, she's amazing. Uh, and two others that I've read recently that I really, really loved. Um, no, there's about 10 others, but um, another one is a book called Matterhorn, a novel of the Vietnam War by a guy named Carl Marlantes, I think his name is, and he was a he was in the Vietnam War, and it took him 20 years to write this novel, which is very close to his own experience, and it was breathtaking, absolutely an, an astonishing achievement, that book. Um, and another one called Far From the Tree, which is a piece of creative nonfiction, about children with horizontal identities by Andrew Sullivan, meaning that the children do not have a similar identity to their family members, and so how you make connections mm. with kids who are very different from you. I don't have any kids, but again, it was an you know just an astonishing piece of work. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just been a great. Oh, it's always great. There are so many good books out there. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. have a library in your house? Uh, well, I have a library everywhere. Um, the <laughs> other thing. Um, I've been reading is because my new book has a, uh, the Truth Commission has a plot that revolves around graphic novels. Um, so I've been reading a lot of graphic novels and they've just been blowing me away. Mm -hmm. I remember reading Mouse, um, M A U S. Yes, right. Um, and I could not stop. It was an assignment for school, but I, I laid in bed all day long and I read through both books. Yeah, well, there are some fantastic, fantastic books. Essex, um, I'm reading Essex County right now, which is brilliant. I mean, they're, I mean, actually, the first story made me cry, and they're so good. So very good. Awesome. Okay, lots of good material. We will share this with everyone. For the last part of the interview, I want to get into um, we have someone who wrote into So Can You to ask about writing because she is so interested in it. She knows it's what she wants to do, um, but she's feeling that what you probably what you were feeling when you approached the the Canadian television writer about you know what should I do? I've been wanting to write and yearning to write, <clears throat> and so she has a couple practical concerns about it. Worried about being able to pay her bills and supporting her family. It's a big one, um, and that's one of the things that's holding her back. Um, well, it sounds very harsh, but don't quit your job. Find a way to write in your free time. Um, if you add financial pressure on top of the desire to write, and it's too much. It's um, there are very there are a few writers who have done it. Um, a local Nanaimo writer called Chevy Stevens quit her. I think she quit her job. She was a real estate agent. Quit her job, sold her house, and then just spent her time writing. Um, that's you know, and it worked out extremely well. She's doing incredibly well. However, for 99.9% .9 of um, writers, that would just be a recipe for disaster. Um, you can get a novel written in an hour a day, five days a week for, you know what I mean? Like you don't need to quit your job. You can still pay your bills. Um, I wouldn't put financial pressure on it. Mm -hmm, good, especially when it's the main concern. How can you be creative if you're worried about starving to death? Um, mm -hmm. So just carve out little pieces of time, five or six days a week, and, you know, try to try to keep working. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, the next one she's concerned with um, is just worrying about getting a publisher. How do you create a, a, a really rich relationship with your publisher? Uh, well, first of all, um, the best thing to do is to write a really, really great book that lots of publishers want. Um, <laughs> so until you have that, it's sort of academic. Um, and then when you have a good publisher, then you can go to 
or a publisher, period. You know, sometimes for your first book, you're just happy to get published. Um, and But once you have that, then it's, um, you know, you just respect that everybody's busy, everybody's a professional, everybody wants your book to do well, and that means that you, as the writer, promote the heck out of it. You do your very best for it. And um, the people in publishing are very, very, they work really hard for almost no money. Nobody's trying to screw the writer, um, or at least, not many people. There mm -hmm. may be the odd one. Um, and then so take your contract to the Writers Union of Canada to help you get it negotiated if you can't find an agent to do that. Um, don't involve lawyers because they don't understand publishing unless they're publishing lawyers, in which case, you know, you're and they're very expensive. So writers union, other writers to help you negotiate your contracts, figure out what rights to keep, which ones to um, let them have. Um, but the the worst thing you can do for yourself, as far as I'm concerned, is um, approach your publisher like they're your enemy. They are not your enemy. They are. Um, that's a huge investment on their part to take your story. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes publishing can feel like you're getting screwed, but generally it's just a matter of finite resources. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, and especially when you spend, maybe you pour five years of your life into this book on your own and it's yours, when it comes to involving another person, there's going to feel like push and pull, but it's just a natural oh, yeah. part of the process. And uh, usually publishers love books, that's why they do it in the first place. Yes, and they, you know, the editors and marketing people and so forth are, they're book lovers, they're serious book lovers, so, you know, and as I say, they work incredibly hard, they don't get paid very well, they don't get a ton of prestige, so the more you can work with them, the better off, um, because they are your biggest allies. And anybody who's spent some time self-publishing a book understands what publishers do for them. Mm -hmm. And last question, making stuff up, which is for when you're in fantasy, when you're in fiction, yeah, of course, you, just, you love creating things, but how much of it does actually involve um, research? and really learning about what you're writing about. Can you write a book in a vacuum? Um, well, nobody's going to write a book in a vacuum because everybody's lived somewhere and had relationships and so forth, so you're always going to be drawing on that stuff. And how much research you do is going to depend on how personal your book is. If your book ends up being quite personal, set in a place where you live um, with people who are like you, Research will probably be minimal. It'll be your memories, your thoughts, your feelings. However, if you're going to embark on a fantasy, for instance, um, or a piece of you know a piece of fiction that is very outside your um, domain, then there'll be a ton of research. Um, if it's historical, there'll be a ton of research. You need to learn world building skills if you're going to go far afield. And I think that's probably part of why a lot of first novels are quite um, quite personal and autobiographical because. You know, there's all that drive to write, but there's not as much drive to research necessarily. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So it depends very much on the on the particular title. I did no research for the Alice books whatsoever. I just thought, man, wouldn't this be funny? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it all worked out. It's it did. <laughs> yes. All right, well that brings us to the end, and I just have one last question, and okay. you kind of brought up at the very beginning, which was one of the, the traits of, a, of a, an author and a writer would be, you know, having that will, the will to keep going. Yes. What do you, what do you think are two other traits that are kind of vital to, to being writers? Um, an ability to be by yourself. If you can't tolerate time by yourself, um, it's kind of lonely, like the writing process is quite a lonely, you need to be alone a lot. Um, and so if you can't handle that, it's probably going to be a tricky. Maybe you should get into, and in that case, there are other kinds of writing, like TV writing or, mm. you know, there are kinds of writing that have, they're more um, uh, collaborative. Um, so being alone and the ability to get wildly enthused about things while you're writing a book and then let them go and get on to some <laughs> new things. Being um, an enthusiast. Um, I think writers have to be enthusiasts and they have to be, and part of that is they have to be really, really curious about people and about places and about just infinitely curious and observant. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sitting down with me today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. If you hang on, Renee, one moment, I will introduce my little rat here and he might get a bit scrabbly. So. You want to say hello to Renee? Don't pee on me. See, this is the, uh, so you're not alone. Hi, yeah. <laughs> one of these. Oh. He's cute. Yes, this is little rodeo. Oh, he's waking up. He's waking up.
waking up. There, so somebody to walk with me. Yes. Yes. And keep you on your toes. <laughs> exactly. Very much. So we're looking forward to the day when he mellows out. Yeah. Um, okay, Renee. Well, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, everyone, if you want to check out Susan Juby's work, you can visit her website. And if you want to learn more about being an author, you can visit the So Can You page. Take care. Bye. Thanks for persisting through Google+. Thank you, too. Okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Bye.